We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrevex. Joining me today is Ted Oakley, author, founder, and managing partner at Oxbow Advisors. How are you today, Ted? I'm great, Tom. Thanks. Great to have you back here. So, Ted, as the as the Fed is trying to control supply side inflation by raising interest rates, in your view, is this going to be an effective tool to try and control this type of inflation? Well, you know, Tom, it becomes effective because you run it into a recession. It's not really because of what they're doing, but you know, when you have a recession, everything uh, gets hammered, and so prices included. And so I think that will be the ultimate outcome of all of this. Uh, it's not so much that raising rates will fix it, but recession should fix it. And I think that's where we're headed. Mm-hmm. So what kind of downstream effects of rising interest rates, other than you know the general equity markets pulling back, are we going to see due to these rising rates? Does this negative wealth effect really start to hit many areas that the average person, you know, looks at when they start to see that their 401k is down, let's say 20 or more percent. You know, it, it's true. And it affects so many things that people don't see, but if, you know, it starts, for example, with the banks who now have a four and three quarter prime. So a prime plus one loan now is five and three quarter, uh, much higher than it was, uh, you know, like 15, 18 months ago. But then it affects housing. We're starting to see that. You know, you've got a 6.1 30-year mortgage rate right now. If you add the cost of insurance, which they really run up, insurance companies have taxes. Um, it's really getting nasty to try to buy a home, first-time home. And and the, but it goes on even further than that. In that, uh, once you, uh, what we find with people is that once they start to see their stocks and their real estate starts to stumble a bit they start to pull their horns in. And I think that's overall where you see it. And then even as far as private equity and buying companies, all of a sudden you can't finance as cheaply as you could. All of those things fit in. It's a big, it's a, it affects so many different things along the way. Mm-hmm. And obviously we've seen mortgage rates really go, you know, double or triple really over the last five to six months, let's say. Does that really start to, as you say, have that negative wealth effect? Is that is that one of the main contributors to this? Well, I think it, it becomes, the, in this respect, if someone starts to see a lot of homes go up for sale or a little, lot of lease signs go up in their neighborhood, then they start to realize that, hey, maybe the game's over here. Maybe it's not going to just keep right on going. And they had been thinking about selling the home And all of a sudden they look up and they're saying, you know, we need to put it out there. And then they go out and put it out and they realize, hey, we don't have 10 bids over the price right now. We don't even have one. Mm -hmm. We may not even get a bid. And so I think that's where it all happens. I I was privy to a a mortgage company this past week, a friend of mine, fairly high up in the mortgage company, and they they go out for bids on mortgage paper. I think they went out for normally they'll go out for 100, 200 billion. Um, they didn't get any bids last week. And they normally get five or six. So see, all of a sudden, it affects more things than you think as you go along. Mm-hmm. You know, we've heard from the Fed that the consumer is in in great shape here. But, you know, it, it makes me wonder when we're looking at exactly as you said, you know, insurance, mortgage rates all going up like crazy. if we're seeing credit card debt get to extreme levels here. How much longer the average consumer has before they really need to start reining in and and selling anything that they can? Well, I would say, Tom, we're starting to see them rein in. I mean, even if you look, uh, you know, look at open table reservations and that kind of thing and food, you know, we're starting to see them cut back on people going out to, Mm -hmm. to eat really particularly expensive places. And then, and then you're then then what happens is the, the whole thing sort of comes together at one time, and uh, one of the things people forget is they keep saying how great the, the consumer was the last four or five months, and we kept looking at it, thinking, 
Well, the savings rate's going down, but obviously consumer credit is going up. So they're just using credit cards. That comes to an end in here, particularly when the economy really falls into recession <laughs> because people lose jobs. Uh, and you're starting to see that now. You know, you're, you're seeing Coinbase and different people, Meta, you know, even Tesla. So you'll, and that's fading out into the economy. And so as that starts to happen, then all of a sudden, they have to look at it and stare it down and say, hey, we have to do something, mm -hmm. the consumer. Ted, when we're thinking about, let's say, how, how the market is behaving, you mentioned that there basically has, in some ways, gone no bid on, on mortgages, like you said. So does the market behavior really change when we start to see margin calls within the, the general equity markets as well? Well, it does, because that really shakes people up, I think. Now, you have to remember, too, uh, Tom, there's a tremendous amount of money on what we call security-based loans that are not actually in margin accounts, but they're collateralized by the stocks. And people don't realize that they're also in, a, in an area where uh, that if it goes low enough, they come after those as well. If you put those two together right now, there's a tremendous amount of money borrowed against stocks right now. And we can't get a real number on those security-based loans, but it's very, very large. And so between those two, if you get you keep coming on down, you're, you're going to get into some situations where the margin calls will affect people's mentality. Mm -hmm. So have we seen any type of that behavior yet or not? Not too much, you know, and we check in with a number of custodians. We manage money and we use a lot of different custodians uh, so we can get a feel for what goes on with them. Most of them tell us that, yes, they've had a few margin calls, but nothing that wasn't uh, correctable or they could handle it. I don't think you're at that point yet where all of a sudden there's so many margin calls that they show up the next morning and just, you know, I've got these automatic emails and phone calls that go out and says, hey, we're going to sell you out tomorrow mm -hmm. if you don't come with some cash. That's when you really get into the fear side. So as we're thinking about the Fed's behavior, Ted, I'm remembering speaking to Danielle DiMartino Booth, and I think she puts it perfectly by saying that they're driving by using the rear view mirror. So do you think that there's a more effective way that they could be determining the path forward rather than looking at this really retrospective data? Well, I do, Tom, and it sounds odd, but the first way I would do it is I would put somebody on that FOMC committee, at least half of them there in the business world and not academics. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at those 11 people or so, almost all of them never had a job outside the government. Mm -hmm. I mean, they know virtually nothing about the main street. And so they have to wait and everything's academically oriented. See, you can't run a, you can't run a business by academic, and nothing against academics, by the way, but I'm just saying that's, that's not the place for that. And if I had to start with something, I'd start with the people and they put the, you know, they put the wrong people. I mean, you know, they, the last person they put on, they put on just because they needed a gender um, racial identity and which is fine. I don't have any problem with that if they're qualified. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we're not putting any business people on. And that's what happens. If they started with that, then you could go to a situation where those business people would say, Hey, by the way, I'm seeing some things out in the marketplace that I know you don't, you're not picking up on all your, you know, look back numbers and your look back graphs. And then all of a sudden you'd have a change of pace in there, but we don't have that right now. We had a little more of it 30, 40, 50 years ago, but not today. It's all academics. Mm -hmm. What about talking to, you know, people on main street? Well, they don't, they don't do much of that. It'd be interesting if you took all of those people and said, okay, you've got to go spend the next two weeks and you have to go to five cities. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to just go to five cities, but you got to go out in suburbia. You got to go down and work where people are working week to week. And I want you to talk to them, find out what's going on in their lives, find out something about them. It's the same way for Washington. But I mean, that's why they miss the points here is because they don't really, you know, I, I know from a personal standpoint, I grew up. Uh, really poor. And so I'll never not know what goes on with a person that's just making it week to week. Mm -hmm. And there's a mentality there you have to understand. And you've got to be able to talk to those people, know what's happening. I spent a lot of time 
uh, talking to drivers and service people and people that helped me and do a lot of things. And I ask them a lot of questions. And uh, and that's how you find out what's really happening. Mm-hmm. So with the Fed's dual mandate of, of price stability and maximum employment, are these two things really at odds here? Well, to a degree, they are. The, the, you know, we, we have this hangover of unemployment that came from uh, everything that got set up. And part of that was uh, they got used to being at home, number one, and then they got used to not having to uh, work. And there was a, people paying, you know, fairly high salaries and paying people to do things when we had a bit of a shortage. But that was before. That was a year ago or nine months ago. It's it's starting to fade away now. And I could see in the next year or so that um, their number one job right now is to find inflation. They have to have price stability. They'll tell you that. Powell said that last week, the week before. Mm-hmm. He said, look, we have to have price stability, which means we're going to fight this thing long and hard. And I don't think they'll be worrying as much about employment right now. It's OK anyway right now to look, you know, look at the unemployment rate. But um, I think they will concentrate, number one, on inflation. I think politically they're getting a lot of pressure on that. So I see that being the number one thing they'll do. Mm-hmm. So do you expect them to actually be able to get a handle on inflation? I remember hearing a statistic that anytime we've seen inflation over 5%, it has never been brought back down without the Fed funds rate exceeding the inflation rate. So could that be the case here? Well, it could be. But I think, Tom, the biggest thing that's going on now is that the the, the free money is ERP sort of thing that's happened all over, started with Japan. And it went to all the other countries, finally got to the U.S. And that was, you know, let's just flood it with money and and take it. That had to come home sometime to be a problem. Well, everybody else is pulling in. Look at Australia. They didn't even announce it. They just started it, you know, and said, hey, we can't do that anymore. Japan's probably right there with it. I mean, you know, you look at the yen, it just keeps on falling, falling. And they've been able to keep yield, yield curve control, but everybody else has pulled away now. You know, they're starting to raise rates. We may be at the very end of all of that experiment. And it was a 10-year experiment, by the way. Uh, And once that goes away, yes, I think you're correct that you'll go back into some sort of stabilized inflation. And that's that's what I think people have to look for. And it probably doesn't happen even lower down until you get into the early part of next year. Mm -hmm. So does the Fed have the ability to actually raise the funds rate to that level, you know, above the inflation rate? Or, you know, would that just cause instant chaos in in all of the markets? Well, they have the ability, but they would never do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if you look even back in the if you look at the inflation rates, I was around them. If you look at 79, 78, 79, 80, 81, 1980, all those four years right there. Um, you know, most of them are nine or 10. We have one that was like 13. And, but the Fed, you know, rent, interest rates were higher than that, you know, quite a bit higher than that. But that was just, you know, we, it blew us into two recessions back to back. And here right now, if they went to, let's just say, a 9% Fed rate, um, uh, we'd be in depression probably, <laughs> more than likely. Uh, I don't think they can do that right now, but I think the two will, over time, you think about it, they'll come together. Inflation will come down. Maybe it comes down resting at 4% or something. And then all of a sudden you see these two converge and maybe that's how it happens. I don't think they could do it right now though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, each percent of interest rate hike they do is worth something like $300 billion in federal debt payment increase. Well, and I think that uh, they have to keep that in mind, too. You know, they've had a free ride. The Fed has really, as far as the, I should say, the Treasury uh, over over the last seven or eight, 10 years. And I don't you know, they, they probably won't get that now. And they keep talking about deficits, deficits, deficits. But nobody's factoring in that if every time you turn a bond over, you've got to issue bonds now, uh, you know, they're going to be expensive. Mm-hmm. You know, in some ways, does that really even matter for the U.S.? Can't they just, you know, print or borrow those dollars into existence in some ways infinitely to be able to, you know, quote unquote, pay that interest? 
Well, it could happen that way, Tom. But the thing about it is, is that the Fed would have to be the larger buyer if that's the case, which they can't be right now. In other words, and I've had a lot of people talk about this. I've had a lot of people say, uh, I've had a lot of people say, hey, you know, what if, what if, what if you got into a situation? And I was discussing some with someone this about Japan the same way. If the government owns so much debt, this is just a thought too, by the way. I don't know if it even worked, but I think it could. Um, where they just say, you know what, um, we're going to take the debt we own and just clean it. It's off. It's done. You know, we own it. We're paying back ourselves. So why not just cancel it out? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that'll happen. I think it would be tough for monetary. But what I'm saying is, you know, they'll do anything to keep it afloat, probably. And uh, it's, it's it'll, you know, they, they've got a tough they're they're finally having to get back to reality now. So we'll just see how they handle it. Mm -hmm. Does that make a very different case for Japan as they owe domestically a lot of their debt versus the, the U.S. that has a very international debt market? Well, obviously, the, the uh, JGB, own, own, they own most, they own more debt of their own debt than anybody. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's going on right now with the yen uh, becoming so weak, um, you know, against the dollar and the currencies, there's a lot of talk out there. And there was a rumored out the last two weeks, a lot of people traded against this, that what would happen is they would have to finally own up like Australia and say, hey, we can't do this anymore. We, we, we've got to change the game here. Mm -hmm. um, they have, they've had yield curve control. If you look at the if you look at the 10 year um, Japanese bond, it's basically between 21 basis points and 25 basis points, and they stick it there. If it goes any higher, they buy the bonds, okay, to keep it there, all right? But there comes a point to where you have to say, you know what, this is killing the currency, it's killing us, it's killing the currency, killing a lot of things. So we're gonna have to follow in with Australia, Europe, US, Canada, you know, we're going to have to follow in when that happens. OK, the grand experiment of um, free money <laughs> is probably over at that point. We go back to normal times. Mm -hmm. What might that path forward, you know, going back to normal times look like, though, Ted? You know, we've had so much cheap, free, easy money for so many years that it's inflated all of these different bubbles. Do all of those bubbles have to come back down, crash, you know, ruin all of these asset markets before we do get something, you know, a semblance of a normal time? Well, I would say, Tom, and what happens, you can go back, you know, many years of this, 150 years, but anytime you have a major bubble, it's usually leveraged. Mm -hmm. And this one's leveraged too. It has, we have a tremendous amount of leverage everywhere and everything. And so what would happen is you it would be a long drawn out process, but you deleverage. Over time, you deleverage, 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 so that you end up with things getting back to where your, your, where your ratio of equity to leverage is doable, is, mm -hmm. you know, you can handle it. Um, right now, that's not the case. So in some ways, we're talking about trying to come in for a soft landing, right? By getting that leverage out of the system. Do you think that that is a reasonable thing that could happen is, is not coming in for such a hard landing on the economy, you know, just from a recessionary standpoint? It's interesting you ask that because I noticed where uh, President Biden today said, hey, I spoke with Larry Summers and uh, there's a good chance we won't have a recession. I'm like, hey, first of all, you're talking to the wrong guy. And, and secondly, you know, what would you know anyway? Uh, and so that that's the kind of thing where I think the Fed is going to blind it on this too, this idea that, see, they always think they can. If I gave you the, and I have these, by the way, but if I gave you the numbers on what percentage of the time the Fed gets their projections right, it would blow your mind. It's about 25%. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing in there that tells me that they, they, that they could come in for a soft landing because they had everything so extended. They blew it up so high that, I mean, you just take uh, housing. We're getting, write our, we're getting ready to write our July report. And one of the things I'll put in there is that, hey, 
you got a problem here with housing. It's not going to go away either because it's so highly leveraged and so far out of line. So we'll we'll see how it goes, but I don't think there's any way they can get a soft landing. Mm-hmm. Sounds like maybe he might have fallen off a bike or something recently if he's taking <laughs> advice from Larry Summers. Well, well, I think so. I always wonder why they gave him clip-ons on, on, on the bike. <laughs> I, I, you know, even, I mean, not nothing against the man. I have respect for him. Don't get me wrong. But I, my point is, is that for a, you know, an 80 year old man, you don't clip him into a bike. <laughs> you put him on something sort of easy. Uh, I know we're all subject here, but that's just a personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Ted. So why is Europe maybe in worse shape than the U.S.? Is it due more to their lack of domestic energy? Well, it's partially due to two things. One, they have a hard time, if you think about it, Tom, they have to control, uh, you probably heard this term, um, fractionalization. And that's where you, you, the euro, you know, if you look, you have a lot of countries and some are really strong economically and then some are really, really weak. Mm-hmm. But then you have the euro and you have Lagarde trying to say, okay, we're going to try to handle the whole thing when it's probably... It's a very hard thing to handle. And the other part is their policies have been really poor. You know, they've um, they really um, sort of grabbed on to every policy that um, was probably not all that great for business in a lot of cases. And so that's that's affected them. And um, I think that's where they are right now. They've got a lot. To me, uh, Europe has a long way to go before they can really get on the get their feet on the ground here. So is energy and food to you maybe the biggest risks to sustained or even increasing inflation from here? Well, that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, if you look, starting to notice of something, though, I don't know if you see this, but in the metals area, for example, you know, most of the industrial metals are lower <laughs> over the last two months. And then oil last week caught a lot of people by surprise. We thought this would happen that you'd come in for a few weeks. And they really drop it big, which they did last week, and people got you know scared about it. But uh, more than likely, they'll have a steady increase in both of those areas. They don't necessarily have to be runaway, but you can't see an area where there's uh, unless you have, by the way, uh, particularly in oil, uh, really really severe recession. Then chances are those two hold up. You know, they they hold their ability to to, to go through here. And I don't know that we're in this kind of thing, but if we're in one of these um, commodity cycles, and I don't know that we are, but we could be. Mm-hmm. Um, if we are, then those two would certainly be two of the things you want to own during that period. Mm-hmm. So on the energy side, Ted, can we look to many of the policies and, and green priorities as a cause of the current you know, energy squeezing market prices? Well, the policies were certainly there for sure. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, you know, if, if, if the administration had just gone ahead with the Keystone Pipeline, if they had just, you know, you, you come in and all of a sudden people don't realize, but when you stop, when you stop drilling uh, deep offshore, that's 25%, okay? And, and you make it impossible for those people to do anything. So you're, you're, you're having people pull in from a capital standpoint because they're like, hey, they're going to drive us out of business here. So we're, we're wanting to do them. And then you put all these regulations and restrictions um, on carbon and all sorts of things into, uh, into the industry in general. Uh, and you're basically what you're trying to do is uh, you're, you're, you're not trying to really help them move into green. You're actually trying to hurt them. Mm-hmm. That's your whole goal is to hurt them. So you can say, you know, we busted this energy blah, blah, blah. And then I'll realize that, well, you may have done that, but you got to realize that most people are still driving a gasoline car mm-hmm. uh, or using energy in business and that sort of thing. So that, I, that's why I think you're where you are in that. It, there's so many things that go into that, but it did not have to be. It, it could have been much less uh, if we'd have had the right kind of leadership on that. Mm-hmm. Ted, I'd like to get back to just one other point from the Fed. Do you think that crashing credit markets is the most likely cause of the Fed pivoting? Well, it's there's two things. One is uh, if you lock up, if you lock up the credit markets, in other words, particularly the bond markets, okay, mm-hmm. if they get locked up because things are so tight, 
the Fed will make a change on that. Uh, you can't lock up your 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 the credit market itself. And right now, uh, it's tight. The credit market's tight. But if you lock it up to where you can't issue any paper or you can't do anything, then all of a sudden they have to do something to loosen up that market. No matter what they think about inflation, you can't have a situation where your credit markets are locked down. It won't work. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden your economy just stops like tonight. So what happens is that that's one of the things that goes on. The other thing is that I think this time they've sort of passed a little bit on the stock market. Uh, and, and the reason is because they're getting tremendous political pressure to uh, get inflation under control before November. And you see all these things are talking about right now. They're talking about you know, changing the gas tax so you don't have the tax on the gasoline. Um, that doesn't help you any with supply, though. See, it's a crazy thing. Uh, and they're talking about, you know, forgiving school loans. And <laughs> it's interesting to me because uh, we ran the numbers on and, and I think 11 million out of 20 million people with school loans are not making any payments anyway. They just don't make them. Mm -hmm. So who cares? <laughs> you know, all of those things are not, they won't do anything, uh, I don't think. But they're, they're, they're pressing the Fed on inflation. I think behind the scenes, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. So if, if we do see the Fed pivot, Ted, will that be, you know, a real marker to you to to start to look at getting back into the market? Is that is that going to be a catalyst, you know, the Fed pivot to really start looking at the markets going back up? Well, it would be, Tom. And the thing about it is, is that these bear markets you know, operate and I wouldn't be surprised. You know, we're rallying today, but it wouldn't be surprised to have a decent rally in here. Mm -hmm. That's what you get in these bear markets. But more than likely, it's something that's not going to be just a six-month phenomenon. It's mm -hmm. probably a year-and-a-half phenomenon, maybe. And the thing about it is, with that is that you, you don't go immediately like in March of 2020, where you just went down 40% in a month, and all of a sudden, they're like freaking out. Mm -hmm. You, you stair-step it. And you know, it's like almost like it's almost like I get used to the pain of as an investor and it's going to be OK. It'll be better tomorrow, that sort of thing. But it doesn't get better. Mm -hmm. And every time you come in here, I notice these people, they come in every time we get these sell offs. Uh, we've, it's been going on this year. Mm -hmm. I think this is a low. We'll buy some people tell me that you know, all mm -hmm. the time. OK. All right. Well, I uh, hope you trade it because you're probably going lower. And that's what happened all during the first six months. And probably happens over the next six months, more than likely. But we'll see how it goes. But the rallies are to be sold, in our opinion, not to be bought. But mm -hmm. once you get to a point of what we call complete disgust, where every if you talk to somebody about stocks, they're like, I don't want to hear about stocks. We're probably there at that point. And we would buy it, sure. Yeah. So, Ted, in your opinion, is there anything worth buying at this time, or is it best to be in cash and, and out of the market? Well, we're really high cash all the way around. I and mean, we're probably, we probably, we've had a good year this year. I'm not saying we're not off a little bit. We are down somewhat, but compared to the markets, we're really great. Um, but the thing about it is, is that you, you, what, what you're looking for in here are things that will make sense for the time being, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll just give you some examples. We have a lot of money in the one and two year treasure. And for the first time in a long time, you can get two and a half on the one year, maybe three on the three plus on the two year. Um, that's not bad for a holding spot, is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Then on the other side, um, we still like the gas pipelines. They pay get great cash flows. You know, they're up there at eight or 9%. Um, we, we like that area and we still like the preferreds. If you look at the preferreds that have, um, that, that, that basically have, you know, they're, they're, they're in their good situation. Most of them are six and a half, almost 7%. We'll buy that. You know, we, we think that's a, and that I'm talking about on very high quality, you know, mm -hmm. too big to fail banks, that kind of thing. Um, on the stock side, a number of stocks, believe it or not, are getting to the point to where they're yielding four and a half or five percent. I think for people, if if you see that number get up to six percent or or higher, seven even on a common stock, 
you have to look at that because that would be a nice return just on the dividend. And if you can get anything else out of that the next five years, we're not quite there right now. Um, most of what we've been selling, we haven't replaced. And, uh, but, but, but that's where we would be looking. Mm-hmm. So in, in a lot of ways, you're just trying to make up for the destruction of your capital through inflation by owning some very liquid, quote unquote, high yielding paper like that, right? We are. We don't want to own high yield, though. We think high yield will get just cratered uh, with the stock. High yield trades like a stock. People forget about that. But you don't buy high yield in a declining stock market. You sell high yield at the top of a market and you buy it at the bottom of a market when stocks are at their low as well. We haven't owned any high yield in a long time, mm-hmm. uh, but we would we will buy it sometimes when it's uh, when the markets are really down a lot. But uh, I think what you end up doing here is, um, and I said this to somebody the other day, but uh, really preservation this year mm-hmm. is beating all markets. It's beating every single market mm-hmm. <laughs> preservation. And so uh, I always tell these people, don't knock the cash because it will help you when times are bad. Absolutely. So, Ted, you have many years of experience of managing money. Is this one of the most uncertain times that you've seen in your career? Well, actually, it's not so much uncertain for me personally, because I've seen some really significant highs. I've seen people get really crazy. Mm -hmm. I would say this, though, it's the most speculative time I've ever seen. That's why I think that when you put together speculative real estate, speculative private equity, speculative business sales, speculative uh, stocks, speculative SPAC, speculative Bitcoin, take all the crypto, you put all of that together and you're in an incredibly speculative time we've mm-hmm. just come through. I mean, off the charts, two or three sigma, two or three standard deviations types. So that means the pain of that will be a long-term thing. You may get rallies, don't get me wrong, but I think the pain of that to, to really ring that out will take it will take some time Mm -hmm. you know as you're as you're talking about this speculative time and we're seeing over the past month we've seen all of these dramatic in some ways blowouts in the in the crypto markets do you think that some of that contagion could spread to the rest of the general equities because of a lot of this leverage coming out of the system well i think it does to this extent tom i i was telling someone the other day and i just gave sort of a, an example, but I said, let's think about it. Um, I'm a person under 40 that has maybe everything I had, which might've been no, no more than hundred grand or 150 grand, but I had it all in crypto. Mm-hmm. I've lost most of it. Certainly we'll lose it on NFTs. Um, and, and so um, I had my mom and dad thinking about that too. And so they had bought some crypto and I've got them you know, buying crypto and driving electric cars, doing all the things that I think they should be doing, but all of a sudden, none of it's working. Mm -hmm. And they look up and then I think what that causes the parent to do, or the person that really is looking at those other people is to say, or relatives, to say, you know, I think I'm going to pull in a little bit here because I've just watched my son, in my case, my my nephew, Had sixty thousand dollars worth of NFTs that went to three hundred bucks, <laughs> and I'm like, I told him to sell part of it, but he wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. But the, my, what I'm trying to say is, here you start to look at that and you think, you know, that's it's my kids, whatever. I'm going to pull in here. I think that's how it sort of unravels in here. Yeah, you've got some big people that have a million, two million, three million, but they can probably afford to lose that. But the real killer are these people under 40 that could have used that for a down payment on a house. They could have done something. And from a depression standpoint, it has to be depressing to them. Because I used to have, I'll give an example. Last year, I probably had 10, 12 young people that would always, under 40, that would send me emails or drop me a text or something and say, man, I hope you enjoy staying like you are because you're going to really miss out on the greatest profit of your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a couple of them, I I told them, I said, look, I'm just trying to save you some money because it's not going to work. But but (laughs) 
And I'm not going to rub it in and call them back this year and say, hey, how's it working out? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But I'm just saying I don't hear from anybody, nobody now. So you kind of see what happens. Mm-hmm. Funny <laughs> that how to that... me is how it plays out. They're asking the question. That's how that overrun plays out. And they say, you know, all of a sudden you had a three trillion market. It's probably going to go to three or four hundred billion when it's all over with. It's eight hundred billion now. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, they lose most of it. And, you know, then they have to be depressed again. <laughs> and that's really what happens. Mm-hmm. But most young people most young people hit a wall. I mean, there's almost all young people have to learn the hard way. They have to run into the wall, lose a bunch of money. And then when we get to be 50 or 60, say, so, yeah, I learned that lesson. And we all learn lessons. And believe me, you're looking at a guy that's learned about as many as anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> Learning lessons the hard way is unfortunately more instructive than just reading about it, right? Hey, I've made virtually every mistake you can make, Tom. Mm-hmm. So I'm not knocking people for making errors because I've made plenty of mistakes in my investing life. Mm-hmm. Ted, I'd like to kind of wrap up on this point. You know, you and I have spoken before about the real estate market in China and how that could affect the West. And I keep seeing tidbits of news about Evergrande bonds becoming valued at, at zero here and there and how that can affect the markets all over the world. You know, of course, this was a massive story when it happened. Do you still see a risk from the Chinese debt or housing markets as affecting or or being material in this environment? Well, I since I'm not a you know I'm certainly not uh, an expert on it, but I, I read a lot, I know a lot, and one of the things I've found about it is I don't think China, I don't think the Chinese government um, will allow too much of that to get away from them. I mean, obviously, it's a you know, it's a problem and they'll have to work through it as well as everybody else. But I think unlike a lot of countries, uh, first of all, we won't know what they do because we, we won't have the right numbers. Mm-hmm. But I have a sense that what they'll do is just, uh, you know, you know, make their, their people can really, they can, they can get down and work hard and, and hang in there. And I think what will happen is that's sort of the way they'll go about that. I think the problem with the rest of the world is that the governments themselves made money so cheap, they caused their own problem. It had nothing to do with China. And so, and we'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Excellent, Ted. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up for today. Is there anything you'd like to add before we do? Not really. Um, you know, I, I hope everybody's having a, 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 keeping their head on straight here. I know, uh, I know a lot of people probably had more equity exposure than they should have had. And they got caught up in sort of the Wall Street mantra that says, just uh, put it all in, it'll be fine in 20 years. But it doesn't work that way when it goes against you for a while. And, uh, and uh, you know, again, that's one of those lessons. But, but if I were had to leave people with anything, even if the markets go up from here, I would still say just because of where we are, you probably you should have more liquidity than normal. Mm-hmm. But we'll see. Excellent, Ted. I I think that's sound advice from here. Of course, you do lots of market updates and stuff that you post on your website at oxbowadvisors.com. Anywhere else you'd like to point people to? Well, Oxbow Advisors is where we put everything. We obviously, we're we're big on LinkedIn, Twitter account, and various things. It's all under Oxbow Advisors. But but you'll see, you know, we'll do, we, every quarter we do a quarterly letter, and then we do a live video. We do a, we, we do a live update too, which is, um, which is, it's probably the most watched thing we we have. Uh, it doesn't go that long; it's 15, 16 minutes. But we try to cover some territory and give you some thinking about what's going on right now. So we'll we'll see, and that'll come that'll be coming out the first two weeks of July. But uh, but that's about they can get about anything they want at the website for sure. We you know we've got books there. In fact, we've got a brand new book coming out. But um, uh, they'll see everything there. What's the new book going to be about, Ted? Well, I wrote a book 25 years ago and 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 and, and really redid it a couple of times. Call you sold your company, uh, get ready for change. And I redid it. Um, really, we've got two books coming out this year. But the first one is this one, and it's. Uh, about what happens to you after you sell a company. I think people today need to understand that if you sell a business today, it's probably one of the most precarious times for you to reinvest the proceeds mm-hmm. 
than there ever was. And I think, I think that's the problem right now. Uh, they're getting paid enormous sums for their companies, but when they turn around and try to re, reinvest, to try to produce what they want to produce, it's a, it's a risky bet out there right now. So we, that book's a little bit about that, but it's about mostly emotions, your family, uh, leaving it all behind, that was your baby. Um, anybody that sold a business or getting ready to sell a business, they'll, they'll enjoy that book. Mm-hmm. Um, we have another book coming out next, really in the first quarter of 23, um, about, uh, about a balanced portfolio, but it'll be a little different look. Excellent. Thanks so much for your time today, Ted. Really appreciate it. Okay, Tom. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.